on World News Tonight. India of late. Double trouble for India as a boat capsizes killing dozens in Kerala while ethnic violence breaks out in northeast areas in Manipur. Monarchy in shambles. Even though 57% of Britain approves of the monarchy, this number seems to be dwindling each passing day. What does the future hold for the monarchy? Find out tonight. Important talks. Japanese Prime Minister Kishida expresses sympathy for victims of Japan's colonial past in the Korean Peninsula in the infamous Kishida Yoon meeting. Long live the king. Windsor Castle turns into a concert stage as many big names in the music industry perform to celebrate the coronation of His Majesty King Charles III. This is Ada Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Sanuvi Mudanayaka. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News. Leaving tonight, India's double mystery continues throughout the weekend and into the new week, ranging from boats capsizing to ethnic violence that caused the Indian military to get involved. At least 22 people have died after a double-decker boat capsized off the coastal town of Tanur in the Malampur district of India's southern state of Kerala. Abdul Nazar, Malampur District Junior Superintendent of Police, said that the boat, which was carrying about 40 inbound passengers, overturned as it was overcrowded. The state's Ports and Fisheries Minister, V. Abdul Rahiman, who was helping to coordinate rescue efforts, said that most of the victims were children on school holidays. The death toll was likely to rise as the boat was stuck in muddy waters and was being pulled out to rescue those trapped inside. The state's Chief Minister tweeted his condolences to the victims' families and urged the district's authorities to oversee the rescue. Boating accidents are common in India where many vessels are overcrowded and have inadequate safety equipment. Still in India, ethnic violence in the Indian state of Manipur has killed more than 50 people, left hundreds hospitalized and displaced 23,000 according to hospital officials and the Indian Army. At least 55 people have been left dead and a further 260 hospitalized since violence broke out between members of the Kuki and the Meitei ethnic groups earlier this week. The Indian military meanwhile said that 23,000 civilians had fled the fighting, with displaced people being housed on military bases and garrisons in the state. The two ethnic groups have been clashing in the streets of Imphal in India's east and elsewhere. The army said that it had rescued a total of 23,000 civilians and moved them to an operating bases and military garrisons. It added that there were a ray of hope and a lull in the fighting due to the rescue work carried out by the 120-125 army and Assam rifles, which had been working tirelessly for the past 96 hours to rescue civilians across all communities, curb violence and restore normalcy. It said that it had also enhanced surveillance efforts using drones and helicopters. The Meitei community, who make up about 50% of the state's population, have for years campaigned to be recognized as a scheduled tribe, which would give them access to wider benefits including health, education and government jobs. Scheduled tribes are amongst the most socio-economically disadvantaged groups in India and have historically been denied access to education and job opportunities. If the Meitei community are given scheduled tribe status, other tribal groups said that they fear that they will not have a fair chance for jobs and other benefits. Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida arrived in Seoul for a two-day talk with South Korean President Yoon suk yeol becoming the first Japanese leader to visit the country in more than five years. Protesters said that Japan must face up to its history and stop distorting and embellishing the facts of Japan's wartime colonization of the Korean Peninsula. Unsurprisingly, the message that Japan's Prime Minister Kishida gave on forced labor victims was not that much different from the one he gave when he met President Yoon in March, as he still avoided using the word apology. But for the first time, he did say that he felt heartbroken for those who had to work in difficult conditions, apparently referring to the Korean victims of wartime forced labor. As I said when President Yoon visited Tokyo in March, our government's stance remains and will continue to remain that we uphold the historical recognition made by previous cabinets, including the joint declaration made in October 1998. My heart aches for those who had to work under difficult conditions at the time. Japan has been saying that it would continue to, quote, uphold the stance on previous cabinets, including the joint declaration between former leaders of the two countries, made in 1998, without using the word apology. 
The joint statement between former South Korean President Kim Dae-jung and former Japanese Prime Minister Keizo Obuchi includes Tokyo's deep remorse and heartfelt apology for causing tremendous damage and suffering to Koreans during its colonial rule. In response to Kishida's latest remarks, a senior official from Seoul's presidential office noted that President Yoon expressed gratitude and said he hopes this will enhance cooperation between the two countries. While meeting Kishida on Sunday, he stressed that it's important to let go of the past and move forward. Since President Yoon took office in May last year, his administration has been pushing to mend ties with Japan. Seeking to improve relations, the South Korean government in March laid out plans to solve the long-standing dispute over compensation for people subjected to forced labor by Japan, through funds secured by Korean companies instead of the accused Japanese firms. The victims and supporting civic groups protested, saying this issue cannot be resolved without sincere apologies and participation by the Japanese companies that are responsible. But President Yoon on Sunday reiterated that the government is not willing to change its plan on this issue. The pomp and ceremony of King Charles III's coronation is over, but the spectacle has reignited debates about slavery, colonial legacies and republicanism. Such as the monarch's reign is beginning, a number of Commonwealth realms are considering independence and re-examining the legacy of British colonialism. Although some view the coronation of King Charles III as a joyous occasion, the monarchy remains a subject of controversy across the globe. At this ceremony in Ottawa, during which a new stamp honouring the king was unveiled, dozens gathered to celebrate Charles III being crowned monarch of the United Kingdom and 14 Commonwealth realms on Saturday. From our beginnings as a French colony to today, the monarchy has been an integral part of our institutions and our identity. Similar scenes of celebration here in Sydney, where Australian monarchists watch the live stream of the event. Well, for me, it is the first time that a king of Australia or a monarch of Australia has been crowned, so I am witnessing history in the making. At this pub in Sydney, though, some were apathetic about the event. Others said that the younger generation did not care about the royals and that Australia did not need the royal family. To be honest, I feel like I'm not that fussed about the coronation. I think it's more of an older generation thing. Forget about the king, forget about the queen. We don't need that stuff. In Jamaica, as well as in other countries in the Commonwealth, Saturday's coronation is a painful reminder of oppression and colonialism's violent past. We still have the institutions of slavery and colonization with us today in 2023. And we need to do much more. And so removing the king symbolically ends that phase in our journey. Following the queen's death last year, certain Commonwealth nations, including Belize and Jamaica, have been examining ways to defect from the monarchy entirely. Faced with a funding crisis, the World Food Programme will suspend food aid to over 200,000 Palestinians starting next month. The agency will continue to provide aid for 140,000 of those deemed most at risk in the West Bank and Gaza. The United Nations World Food Programme says it's suspending food aid for over 200,000 Palestinians starting next month due to severe funding issues. It represents about 60% of its caseload in the region, and it could get worse. These were Palestinians protesting outside the agency's Gaza City offices on Sunday. Its country chief, Samir Abdel Jaber, told us it will continue to provide food aid for 140,000 of those deemed most at risk in the West Bank and Gaza. But if a funding solution doesn't come up soon, it will have to cut all food and money aid to Palestinians by August. Jamalat El Dabur's family in Gaza is one of those aid recipients. She's saying that she's scared her family will starve to death and she doesn't know what to do. She doesn't even have a penny to her name, and she's hoping a local social help group will come through. Her husband is sick and jobless. Gaza, long under blockade by Israel and Egypt on security concerns, is home to 2.3 million people. About 45% are unemployed, and 80% rely on international aid, according to the UN and local authorities. 
With his two-decade rule in the balance, the Turkish President Tayyip Erdogan has pulled out all the stops on the campaign trail as he battles to survive his toughest political test yet and shield his legacy from an emboldened opposition. Recep Tayyip Erdogan addressed his supporters on Sunday in his native Istanbul, by far the country's most popular city and electoral trophy. He slammed his opponents with an unapologetically populist discourse. Bye bye, Kemal. Mr. Kemal Kilic Daroğlu, drink as much as you want. You can drink a full keg of beer, but even that will not help you. My nation will not give the floor to an alcoholic, a drunkard. Leader of 20 years, his future seems uncertain. After his opponent struck a historic deal to back one unity candidate, this nation's alliance has brought together six parties, including two formerly pro Erdogan groups. Their candidate, Kemal Kilic Daroğlu, addressed his own supporters on Saturday after unveiling a roadmap to unpick Erdogan's legacy, restoring a corroded parliamentary democracy, reining in the inflation that hit 85% last year and shifting West in foreign policy. I want you to know that we will address everyone's issues. I will not discriminate in any way. I will embrace 85 million, regardless of party, identity or belief. I will be the president of 85 million. Kilic Tarolu has also secured the support of the pro-Kurdish HDP. The minority makes up 20% of Turkey's population and once embraced Erdogan's rule that the president has failed to end discrimination against the group. As the country reels from the February earthquake that killed at least 50,000, recent polls put the two candidates neck in neck. We'll be back with more world news after this short commercial break. Welcome back. The Arab League welcomed back Syria's government, ending a more than a decade-long suspension and securing President Bashar al-Assad's return to the Arab fold after years of isolation. Bashar al-Assad is back on the international scene. The Syrian government has been readmitted to the Arab League, having been suspended in 2011 over its bloody crackdown on peaceful protests, which spiralled into a civil war. We are totally convinced that the only way to resolve the crisis in Syria is a political solution from inside Syria, without any external interference. It's a far cry from 2013, when the Syrian opposition represented the country during an Arab League summit in Qatar. More than 500,000 dead and millions of refugees later, Assad has clawed back territory with support from Russia and Iran. The Syrian president's diplomatic fortunes changed when China brokered a rapprochement between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Having supported the Syrian opposition, Riyadh now had to change its approach. Other regional capitals have been gradually warming to Assad, a phenomenon that accelerated after an earthquake in February devastated parts of Turkey and Syria. Although the 13 member states that attended the session in Cairo backed the decision to readmit Damascus, there were nine absentees, most notably Qatar, which continues to back Syrian opposition groups. Assad's return comes with some conditions. The Arab League expects to work with him to find a solution to the protracted civil war and to facilitate the delivery of aid to Syria. Alberta has declared a state of emergency after wildfire spread across the western Canadian province, driving nearly 25,000 people from their homes. Faced with more than 100 wildfires, Alberta's Premier Daniel Smith called the situation unprecedented. Presidents of Edson, a town of more than 8,000, were told to leave immediately. Residents said a hot, dry spring had created so much clinging and some 122,000 hectares had burned so far. Many of the fires are burning out of control, fanned by strong winds. The worst hit areas include Drayton Valley, about 140 kilometers west of the provincial capital of Edmonton, and Fox Lake, some 550 kilometers north of the city, where 20 homes were consumed by fire. Firefighting helicopters and air tankers have been brought in, and the federal government has offered assistance from Ottawa.
Edmonton Expo Centre is accommodating more than 1,000 evacuees and in the town of High Level, a curling rink is being turned into a temporary shelter. Alberta is a major oil producing region but so far oil facilities do not appear to be in immediate danger. More than 175 people have been killed in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo after heavy rainfall caused rivers to overflow and inundated the villages of Bushushu and Nyambukubi. Flash floods in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo on Friday killed scores and destroyed buildings, forcing aid workers to stack mud-covered bodies on top of each other. The rainfall in South Kivu province caused rivers to overflow a day prior, inundating the villages of Bushushu and Nyamukubi. People were seen digging through the mud to recover bodies. Survivors gathered outside a wooden shed where Red Cross workers placed corpses on top of each other. Some describe unimaginable loss. I lost my husband and now I am left with five children. I lost my wife and 16 of my children. All of them are gone. I am alone in my home now. The leader of a civil society group Martin Nuganyozi said people had nowhere to live and nothing to eat. Dozens of injured people were being treated at the territory's main hospital, where Dr. Norbert Walangulu said there is not enough medicine and equipment to properly treat them. It's an opportunity, he says, to send a message that during disasters we must be rescued and helped with consumables. Floods and landslides are not uncommon in South Kivu, which shares a border with Rwanda, where this week heavy rains killed 130 people and destroyed more than 5,000 homes. The head of the United Nations nuclear watchdog expressed growing anxiety about the safety of a Russian-occupied nuclear power plant near the front lines of fighting in Ukraine after the Moscow-installed governor of the area ordered the evacuation of the city where most plant staff live. Near the eastern front line, Ukrainian soldiers trained to deal with an invisible enemy, radiation. The risk of a chemical or nuclear attack by the enemy is always there. That's why we're training to detect toxic substances and increase radiation levels. It's not just the risk of a potential nuclear weapon strike. The United Nations nuclear watchdog is increasingly worried about the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant after the Kremlin-installed governor of the area ordered the evacuation of a nearby town amid intensified attacks. We must act now to prevent the threat of a severe nuclear accident and its associated consequences for the population and the environment. Meanwhile, this weekend, deadly fighting continued in the regions of Kherson and Donetsk, and Ukrainian forces used drones to attack the largest port in Russian-occupied Crimea. Paramilitary leader Yevgeny Prigozhin said the Russian army has promised to give him more ammo and weapons after last week making a particularly scathing tirade against Russian military leaders, threatening to pull out of Bakhmut, where his Wagner Group forces have been leading a months-long attritional assault. Welcome back. For more news, let's take care on the world in a minute. Red Bull's Max Verstappen cruised to another victory at the Miami Grand Prix with Sergio Perez coming in second to sealing yet another Red Bull 1-2 in the 2023 season. They were followed by Aston Martin's Fernando Alonso, George Russell and Lewis Hamilton of Mercedes AMG in fourth and sixth and the two Ferraris of Carlos Sainz and Charles Leclerc in fifth and seventh. New Zealand will invest 490 million New Zealand dollars to boot the salaries of defence personnel and 328 million New Zealand dollars to upgrade defence forces' assets and infrastructure. The boost to payroll was so the defence force can maintain and attract the skills, experience and expertise needed. At least seven pedestrians were killed and several others injured when an SUV mowed down people near a homeless shelter that attends to migrants in Brownsville, Texas. 
The male driver was in custody, left in a Martin Sandoval of the Brownsville Police Department said, adding he was charged with reckless driving and could face additional charges. Russia stages an annual Victory Day parade on Red Square amid particularly tight security after a series of drone attacks, including on the Kremlin Citadel, symbolic heart of the Russian state that Moscow has blamed on Ukraine. Many Chinese even to offset risks after the pandemic are snapping up second homes overseas and Thailand, with its good international schools and quality medical facilities, is providing an attractive investment. That is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you miss any of the stories tonight, you can watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And finally, we take a look at how the Windsor Castle transformed into a concert venue as some of the biggest names in the music performed to celebrate the coronation of His Majesty King Charles III. Good night.